project-based learning class come to fruition in West Hartford to begin with? Two avenues that brought it to, to become a class. One is the state of Connecticut mandated that uh, each school in the state of Connecticut had to have a senior exhibition course, capstone-like course, where students would be engaged in a project, and then they'd have to present their project uh, to uh, the audience. Then there was an administrator here uh, several years ago who wanted to really see this actually happen. And she said, while well, other schools were thinking about it, she thought it was a good idea to start. So Connor had a proposal, and they came to me and said, would you be interested in putting together a course? And I am very interested in project-based learning. So for me, it was a natural fit. Project-based learning. Can you define that for us? No, it's a really good question. So I have a little bit of background in human rights education. And so that, that my human rights class was very much project-based. So I just took what I was doing in that class, and then I did a lot of reading over the summer. I talked to a lot of teachers who, do, who did project-based learning, people here in this district, and then I also talked to people in other districts. I read a lot over the summer, and I'm the kind of person who likes to think a lot about, uh, about what I want to do. I'm pretty reflective that way. So I spent the whole summer trying to plot it out. Um, I'm also inspired by students because I think students really care a lot about what's going on, but they need models, and I see myself as a mentor rather than their teacher. So I wanted to be able to put something together that would take students through the steps that would not only just have them research a problem, but actually find a solution and act on the solution. I think GPS was much more than just a class. It wasn't about taking notes every day and listening to teachers' lectures. It was more about pushing your limits um, and finding yourself in the class. Um, I know for my project specifically, I worked with the homeless. Um, I interviewed um, five or six homeless individuals and we learned about their stories and where they come from and it was all incredibly interesting and I think I learned more about myself and my community in those few days than I had, had learned in uh, my four years at Hall. So project-based learning is a challenge. There has to be a lot of leeway in the classroom for kids to be able to explore, ask a lot of questions, make mistakes, feel comfortable making mistakes, taking a risk. Uh, the classroom, most likely you'll notice my classroom is usually in a circle, we're always having discussions, but I, they also have to know that I'm willing to take a, a few risks here in, in um, addressing certain topics. Um, so part of it is sort of, a, uh, it's a classroom that is dynamic. I think that's, that's one of the things that's important. The other thing is, I think uh, students want to understand that they have to know something. So you just can't embark on a on a project without knowing something. And, I, and that's one of the things that I instill very early on, that they have to research. Nobody can make change unless they understand all the factors that are part of it. And I should actually say that one person who really helped me with this is one of my colleagues in the science department, the science department head, Mike Rollins, who taught me about systems theory. It's the best thing that I've ever learned from another person because he helped frame a discussion about how you actually make change. And how you do that is you have to understand what the system is and then look for the fault lines of the system to find out how to make change through leverage points. I think you have to have a little bit of, um, I think you have to be willing to show kids that you don't know all the answers. I don't know all the answers. If they say to me, Mrs. Devine, what about this? And I'll say, oh, well, let's explore it. On the walls of your classroom are posters about habits of mind. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So there's been a lot of theory out there about what makes us, what kind of learners we are, what, what makes us a successful learner and adult. And traditionally, we used to think that, well, it's only how well we read, how well we write, but um, a man named Art Costa came up with this idea of habits of mind. And actually, what that means is that there are many different strategies that we as adults, we as human beings use to gather information, use information, apply it, um, and those strategies, or char those characteristics, I should say, are things like persistence, having a sense of humor, um, being open to wonderment and awe in life, as well as paying attention to detail, um, being flexible, being a flexible thinker, um, being, a, being able to address the problems, the obstacles, and rather than uh, avoid them, confront them. So those are, these, are the, those, these are habits of mind. 
And so one of the things I do in class is start right the year off right away with asking them about what kind of a learner they are and what strategies they use, what characteristics they use to, to learn and what has been helpful to them and then also what they might need to uh, you know, work on in terms of developing better habits to be a successful adult. In addition to habits of mind, I also have them look at themselves as, a, uh, as a, a different kind of learner, not just a person who reads and writes. So I always ask them, are you music smart? This is multiple intelligence. Are you music smart? Are you kinesthetic smart? Are you nature smart? Everybody is smart in a different way. And I think in order to collaborate, to solve a problem, you have to recognize everybody's strengths. Otherwise, you won't be able to solve the problem. Because one person can't solve the problem. It's, it's a group effort. The toughest part, I would say, of this class is collaboration. Because in education, we talk about collaboration, but we really don't do it. We say, work in a group, and then we take them out of the group, the kids out of the group, and then they're done. In this, the entire premise is that they have to work with other people to solve a problem and advocate and build capacity to solve the problem. That's very difficult. So I spend a lot of time working with a colleague in the theater department, and he actually comes into class and does several sessions with them about building trust and building loyalty with each other and understanding collaboration from a very basic idea. And then we talk a little bit about when, when collaboration works, how do you build trust with another person. And uh, one of the ways that really what helps me understand how they're learning is they reflect constantly in their learning logs. So the only thing that I grade is their other learning logs, their reflections. They have to tell me, how are they applying habits of mind? How are they using multiple intelligence? How's the collaboration going? Um, what systems are in place? And then finally, the other strategy that I, I work with students early on in the year is this idea of sustainability. And that's when I bring in another science teacher, uh, Kathleen Coghill, and she comes in and teaches the kids, or my students, about sustainability. What does it mean to be sustainable, and how can you make your solution sustainable because after all you can make a change but if it doesn't last it's not really a change right so in order to change a system you have to make sure that the components are sustainable so we want to apply those we apply habits of mind multiple intelligence collaboration sustainability systems to problem solving and by the time we get to the second semester they're ready to attack a problem using those strategies one thing that I uh, took away from this year is um, how to be better at collaborating um, with a group of people that I never met before and to come together with these people to achieve a common goal. First day of school. Your students are filing into class. They're seniors. They have a lot on their minds. What are you thinking as you're watching them sit down? Well, there's a couple of things that happen in the beginning. One of the first things I do is I give them a, a card, and, on, and usually uh, I use a postcard. So last year I gave them postcards from South Africa when I took some students and I brought these beautiful postcards in. And I told them that they had to keep the card, and on the card was the website address, the URL, because I said to them um, that well, I'm not giving them any paper because it's a totally digital course. That's purposeful, um, and I realized that I had to really model that all the time. Um, so I gave them the card and I said, this is a pretty card. I, I, I had them come in actually and pick a card up that they like, the picture they like. And on the back of it, I said, write this URL down, keep this with you always, this is the site. So I start with that. I think that sets us off right away. We always, we always work in a circle, so we always talk to each other. And the other thing I always say to them is that this may not be the right place for you because they, there's, there are very few structures in place unlike other classes where the, the teacher will say, you know, this is due here, this is due here, this is due here. It's the kind of a different class because a lot of it you have to sort of internalize. I'll, I'll help, I always say to them, I'll help you along the way, but you'll recognize that if you're one of those people who needs somebody to constantly push you along and script for you what to do, then they might, be the right, they might not be the right place because this is a place that really is about a lot of independence. So um, sometimes, I, at, at the, after the first class, a few kids will say, I don't think this is right. Other kids, they'll look at it as sort of a breath of fresh air. Finally, they're in a place where they can apply what they've learned. And I think this is why education needs to do more project-based learning. Because I think kids need to know things. Students need to know things. I'm not saying they don't. But by the time you get them as seniors, they know a lot. The question is, how do they apply it? And that's what the class is about. As a student, I have a voice and that what I want to do, and if I work hard at something, I can make it happen and I can create change. 
I came to several of your students' mid-year presentations, which were absolutely amazing. And I noticed now, towards the end of the year, they're doing different subjects. How do you pick your presentations, and what's the process? So one of the things I thought about when I first started this was that I think we need we need we needed in the beginning of the year one topic that we could we could we could pull together all the strategies to model for students who might have a hard time understanding well how how does this fit how, do, how does the topic fit with uh, with the strategies so the first year we we did water as an issue because it's something that you could do a lot with the second year we did food and I thought well shelter should be the next issue so. Shelter was the issue that we um, looked, we investigated in the fall and looked at all the, the issues related to shelter. Shelter diversity, shelter diversion, homelessness, children who were in shelter, you know, and who were homeless, et cetera, uh, financial literacy. Um, in the spring, I like to give the kids a little bit more leeway um, because they're not all interested necessarily in the topic that I chose in the fall. The topic I choose in the fall is one purely for pedagogical reasons. Apply what we've learned with the strategies, apply it to this topic. Find out how to do the research, how to curate the research, how to do the digital piece of it, think about um, problem solving. So in the spring though, I, in order for it to be more meaningful to, to students, they have to choose what they, what they love. And not all the students are interested in the topic that I choose. So I ask them, so is there something that you're more interested in? So for instance, one group wants to abandon shelter altogether and they're really interested into sustainable practices in medical facilities. And something I don't know anything about, it sounds like a wonderful idea, both girls who chose this topic are really uh, passionate about, about the environment and they, and they, and they both work in they work, worked with medical facilities and thought, well, we, we, we need to find ways to make them more sustainable. And I thought, why not? So I like to give the kids, the students, a lot of choice. Because choice means that it, it, it makes it more meaningful. The more meaningful it is, the more successful they'll be. What if a student picks a topic that you don't feel is appropriate? Well, it's interesting you ask that question. I've never had that happen in the years that I've been teaching. And in the years I've been teaching human rights, which are which is pretty tricky, some pretty tricky topics, I've never really had something that makes me feel uncomfortable. Not much makes me feel uncomfortable in terms of topics, I have to say, because there's a lot of things in the world, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of topics that are provocative, but yet meaningful and important to address. Um, where I come in as a mentor, I will say to them, so is there enough here, is there, a, is there enough of a system in place to really address it? So I'll give you an example. So uh, one group wanted to do something with mentoring, and they, what they wanted to do they wanted to go into Hartford and they wanted to mentor a group of students at an elementary school. And I said to them, so do you have a, an elementary school in mind? And they said, no. I said, well, first of all, you have to find an elementary school. And you have to find the teachers who might be interested. And what do you plan on doing? They hadn't really thought it through. So my job is really to work with them to think it through. What these, this group has wound up with, however, is fabulous. They're working with at-risk kids at a local, at, at a school here, right here in town. And they realize, of course, that the, the, the kind of issues they want to address being a, a positive role model for middle school students, um, you know, is, is important everywhere, not just in the inner city, right here in their own town. So I, I'm more of a guide on the side, you know. I won't ever say no to a student. I'll say, have you thought this through? You know, what about um, the issue? What about the system? Um, have you done your research? Usually that alleviates any kind of problems we would have. And the groupings of the students, mm -hmm. is that? Totally on their own. I could never choose a group for, I mean, what? that's crazy. In the real world, um, very often, collaboration happens naturally. I mean, in some places, they will choose a group, but I thought, I think it makes more sense for the students to choose, and this is how, how they choose their groups, choose their groups based on their interests, rather than based on who your friend is. And that's one of the first things we talk about right from the beginning, that you should not choose a group, you should not collaborate with, just with the people you like, because after all, um, you might, it, you might be um, uh, ignoring a really valuable asset in another person that you don't really know very well in terms of multiple intelligence that could help you solve that problem. So they, we learn that in the fall and then apply it in the spring. And I think it works pretty well. Thank you.